right, let's get started. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm Diana, and I am the head of research and sustainability at the Global Blockchain Business Council. It is my pleasure to welcome you to GBBC's virtual members forum on decoding Mika, how to manage the new EU framework's data complexities. We are a bi-weekly webinar showcasing the innovative work of our members around the world. And today we're joined by Elodie Demarchi Chouard, COO, and Clara Medali, Director of Research at Kaiko. GBBC Ki member Kaiko is a leading digital asset provider of market data, analytics, indices, and research. And today, for those of you here, whether you are a crypto asset service provider or a local regulator, data will need to be at the very heart of your preparation for Mika regulation, which is the markets in crypto assets regulation of the EU. During this conversation, Kaiko's Elodie and Clara will explore the new data requirements, who they impact, and how they can get a head start before the regulation starts being applied later this year. While Mika seeks to establish a unified legal framework that fosters market integrity and financial stability, significant engagement from crypto service providers is still needed in order to achieve this objective. So briefly, before we begin, I would like to introduce Elodie and Clara. Elodie is currently Chief Operating Officer at Kaiko, and Kaiko is already working with Bloomberg, Fidelity, Deutsche Börse, and more. Prior to joining Kaiko, she was Investment Strategy Manager at VMware, a top private cloud computing company with $67 billion in market cap, where she worked on 18 acquisitions from a few million to a few billion and led the finance integration of Carbon Black, a 2.2 billion EV acquisition in 2019, Elodie was also a vice president at First Citizens Bank, an ex-Silicon Valley bank, and prior, uh, she spent six years working with top-tier investors and entrepreneurs in New York, Boston, and San Francisco. She has a master's degree in uh, science of management and finance from Kedge Business School. She speaks four languages and supports the entrepreneurial community by being a mentor at Stanford a Latino Entrepreneur Program and InnoVexus. She has also been selected to join Bloomberg New Voices as a crypto and digital finance expert. Clara has been involved in the cryptocurrency industry for more than six years, and today she leads the research and marketing teams at Kaiko the cryptocurrency market data provider. She is a frequent guest lecturer and uh, participates in industry events and universities and, and presents, including Polytechnique de Sorbonne and IESEG School of Management. Her expertise encompasses all facets of market structure, the crypto exchange landscape, decentralized finance, and institutional trends. Welcome, Elodie and Clara, and to the audience, we welcome your questions at any point during today's presentation. Please submit them in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and we will take them after the presentation. So thanks, Elodie and Clara, for joining us. I will now hand things over for you to begin. Perfect. Thank you so much, Diana. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Elodie as Diana said, and I'm uh, really excited to be here with you to talk about this uh, topic, which is Mika. To give you a little bit of visibility into what we'll cover today, the next 25, uh, 30 minutes with Clara, um, here is the agenda. First, we'll think of Mika background, meaning what is Mika? How does it apply to? Who does it apply to? I'm sure that's really important for you to know. Second is our perspective is you know, looking at Mika from a data perspective, and we'll tell you more on why data is so important to be Mika compliant. 
Third, we'll go into a bit more details on those requirements for each type of CASP um, to help you understand what are the requirements you need to comply with. We'll finally end with some concrete examples of how this data can be used um, picking, looking at a few different use cases. With that said, Diana already mentioned, you know, who is Kaiko, um, just a few, a few words to close on that and to explain to you why we're here to talk about data within this Mika uh, environment and regulation. Kaiko has been around for 10 years already. We're one of the pioneer in terms of crypto market data. Think of us really um, working with the entire investment life cycle. We work with regulators um, we, in, in the world. We're a global company working with regulators on market surveillance. We also work with asset managers, hedge funds for their pre-trading activities. We also work on the real-time uh, trading activities and then on all post-trades. Think of risk management. It's a very big topic for this year and the coming ones, and also on all the reporting activities related to valuation. With that said, let's just dive into, into Mika background um, and this first step. So basically, you may be wondering, what is Mika? I'm sure you heard a lot about it in the past couple of months or year. Um, very quickly, just a refresher, Mika is the first comprehensive um, European Union effort to regulate crypto assets, issuers, and also providers. What this means is basically it's tailored to crypto assets for those coming from traditional finance. You probably know MIFID 1 and MIFID 2, which were implemented in 2007 and 2018. Uh, Mika is leveraging some of those um, foundational principles to apply specifically to crypto assets. One thing that you should keep in mind that's extremely important at this date, the deadline for compliance. If you are an e-money token issuer or asset reference issuer, you need to be compliant in the next two and a half months. If you are a CASP and for other asset types, you have until December of this year. Uh, but just keep in mind that being compliant with Mika is something that you should actively think if you, if you haven't yet, as this is coming up extremely soon. Now, moving on to uh, the next slide is why was it introduced? Diana already touched on this, uh, but I will just reiterate because it's so important. Mika is really here to create a, a legal framework to promote market integrity, financial stability, and consumer awareness and protection. What this means is Europe, the European Union is uh, providing a framework to enable the growth of digital assets while aiming to protect the consumers and um, ensuring you know, more transparency and more secure markets. One, one caveat or one thing to keep in mind is um, you, the UK is not Come, is not included in this regulation. Um, however, we expect to, to see some similar guidance or principles uh, leveraged from Mika to be implemented in the UK in the future. Now, who does this apply to? Um, so I'm sure you heard of this acronym CASP, it means Crypto Asset Service Provider. It encompasses a lot of um, different services pro service providers. We have listed on the right a few examples, exchanges, custodians, token issuers, trading firms, or called in Mika trading platforms, payment providers, liquidity providers, broker and broker dealers, and advisory firms. So these are just samples or examples of um, what CASP are. And if you are one in, in one of those categories, you should, abs and you have some operation in, um, in Europe or you have some clients in Europe, you definitely are, um, you need to be, to be Mika compliant. One thing that we wanted to highlight here is that there are two, two, um, two aspects of this. The CASP definitely need to be compliant and they need to do everything they can to, to get ready. The other angle are the regional regulators. So as you understood, this framework is global to Europe. It means that each local regulator will have to uh, put in place the, the right checks and audits to um to confirm that those rules are being are being followed so the original regulators and casps are, are are getting ready to ensure that you know the rules are being implemented and the rules um and then there is a body to confirm or check on that now very interesting um on the assets this you know has been uh in a few different topics in, in different um in, in different articles different webinars, one thing to keep in mind is Mika has done a good job in categorizing in 
categorizing, sorry, the tokens into three categories um, to make it simple. So first you have the utility tokens. So those are uh, basically crypto assets intended to provide access to a good or service supplied by their issuers. So here you will you know, recognize some of the, the largest logos from the uh, more standard tokens. As a second type, you have the e-money tokens, uh, which are basically crypto assets that maintain a stable value by referencing uh, one official currency. So here you can see you know, the stable coins. Um, you have Tether, Circle, et cetera, that you know, are the logos that are present here. The third part on the right, the third category that has been um, assessed is called asset reference tokens or ART. And it's basically a crypto asset that maintain stable value by referencing to other assets or currencies. So think of like wrap ETH, um, wrap BTC, um, uh, digital gold, for example. So those are the three categories that Mika um, refers to and that applies framework and, and rules to. You will probably say, okay, what about the others? So that's what we have here in this slide. So Mika doesn't cover everything. Um, you have security tokens that do not fall under under this jurisdiction or the, under those um, this, this law, considering it's captured under financial instruments covered by traditional finance MIFI two that we were referring to earlier. You also have non fungible tokens NFTs um, that are not covered by by uh, by Mika. You have DLT assets, so assets that are automatically issued by blockchain rewards, for example, Bitcoin. One thing, though, to you know, keep in mind is what this means is Satoshi Satoshi is not um, does need to be compliant with Mika. However, any entity moral or legal that is enabling the trading of Bitcoin needs to comply with Mika. So, just something to to keep in mind is if you're trading Bitcoin, um, you need to you need to comply with this. However. What this means is, for example, Uniswap v3 or Uniswap um, is needs to be compliant with Mika in the sense like it's not completely decentralized. And then the limited offerings, which are crypto assets given for free or offered to qualified investors are not uh, in the scope of Mika here. So that should cover, you know, the basics of what is Mika, what in, is intended um, to and what are the categories? Just to summarize before getting into the data piece or data angle, um, what should be top of mind for you is know if you are a CASP. And I think a lot of you, if you interact in the market are, you need to have in mind this June 2024 deadline. Um, if you are the issuer of e-money tokens or art tokens and December for anyone else, basically. So it's coming up really soon. Um, and then last is to have uh, to mind these categorizations of, of the tokens to know in which requirements you will have to um, you will have to follow and, and fall into. So now let's go into why data is so important to be compliant with Mika. Here are just a few challenges. Um, some of you may have made the decision to um, to look at your data and to manipulate the data directly, and you have probably built in this case a very um, you know a full business unit. Uh, considering the, the complexities to, to navigate this ecosystem and the cost associated with it. Or some others may have chosen a trusted data partner to, to help with that, which is something, as mentioned, that we have been doing for the past 10 years. Just here to lay out like the few the reasons why it's so challenging and difficult to manipulate data. First, you have market fragmentation. You have more than 100 different exchanges, centralized, decentralized, thousands of pairs that you need to consolidate and um, in order to have like a full market uh, visibility. Second, inconsistent quality. I think it's not, not you know, a surprise for anyone to say that we're still not in the um, same maturity as in traditional finance. So, some you know, you have exchanges that can fail to clean, to duplicate, normalize the data feeds. means like you have to do it or find like your, your data provider to do that. The infrastructure costs, we're talking about extremely large amounts of data. You need to manage this data, you need to store it. Um, so all the compute storage powers that are associated with this is quite significant. Is significant. We're talking about markets that are extremely volatile, um, hence you always need to, to adapt to that. Market abuse, um, as you, you know, I'm sure, you know, like uh, several abuses have been reported in the past couple of months or years um, where you have like a manipulation of the price and other kind of problems for which 
you need to um to to adapt and be able to identify and lack of trust i think ftx uh, for example is a good example in this case where um you have to you know the uh, poor governance and, and others led to some challenges and having a third neutral uh, data provider to help you navigate this environment is definitely helpful. So just to conclude before Clara, you know, text it over and give you some concrete examples of uh, the kind of data you will need. One thing to keep in mind is cryptocurrency markets is borderless, meaning if you want to have an overview of the market, you cannot just look at one exchange. You need to like put this back into a macro view and understand, um, for example, if you're having a price manipulation on this specific exchange, you need to have access to like the reference rate. You need to know what's the price of this token into a global market to know if there is a price manipulation on this specific exchange. Second pillar here is that on-chain and off-chain markets are interconnected. You cannot just, you know, do completely abstraction of one or the other. You need to have a comprehensive view of the market if you want to assess best, you know, the risks, um, regardless they're operational or actually related to your uh, your strategy or investment strategy. And last but not least, the information that you will you will need to get from your CASP um, as well, um, which are very specifically defined in, in Mika are very important. And you can either do it yourself or you can get help from like a, a trusted data partner to help you navigate this uh, complex environment. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Clara, on the next slide. Great, thank you so much, Elodie. So the next two sections are gonna focus on more concrete examples of how data can actually be used um, in a compliance context under MICA. So if we go to the first part in this section, I'm gonna talk a bit about the obligations under MICA. So what MICA really is, is a licensing regime. Um, and they list a bunch of rules for many different types of CASPs, which are crypto asset service providers. Um, and it's up to the, um, the national competent authorities, which in this case are called NCAs within either like a country or local regional regulators to issue licenses. So all crypto service providers must obtain a license. And that's the most important requirement um, of MICA. Um, but there's a few others here. Um, there's many detailed lists of what to do. So on top of authorization, all CASPs must have adequate controls. This typically means in a business context, context, meaning they need to have robust governance and internal control mechanisms. MICA actually lists all like adequate controls that an average business or CASP should implement um, to be compliant. The third core requirement of all CASPs is to adhere to AML and counter financing terrorism um, obligations. And this means that they need to report suspicious transactions um, that do not comply with these requirements. The fourth one involves capital. So under traditional financial, re financial regulation, there's a lot of reserves requirements and MICA essentially took inspiration from this and applied this to crypto asset service providers. So for there's actually different rules for different types of service providers when it comes to the reserve requirements they need to have on hand, which means that all CAFs must essentially assess the value of the crypto assets that they hold so that they can compute the requirements. And finally, the last is risk management. All CASPs really need to establish very robust risk management controls, monitoring, and stress testing. I think that this is most relevant for the token issuers. For asset reference tokens, they need to do a lot of specifically liquidity stress testing when they are issuing their tokens to make sure that they're able to essentially cash out the people that are getting these tokens. So if we move on to the next slide, we'll dive into a bit more on the specific requirements per CASP. So while almost all service providers um, are included in MICA, we'll focus on just four core ones here. There's a big section on trading platforms. So I think the most important thing that trading platforms need to really pay attention to is the, the tools that they have in place to prevent and detect market abuse, such as wash trading, this is also important from a regulator perspective. Regulators need to be sure that they are validating that abuse is not happening on these trading platforms before they actually grant a license. Trading platforms also need to make sure that there are robust liquidity and stability protections in place, which means things like the markets need to adhere to proper liquidity standards um, 
And finally, on the broker side, not exactly trading, but brokers need to adhere to best ex execution standards, which requires data. So the second category of CASC is asset managers. Asset managers really need to focus on conflicts of interest. They need to identify, manage, and properly disclose these conflicts of interest, which I think historically in the crypto industry, there have been quite a few conflict of interest. So Micah really wants to emphasize that this is a very critical function of any investor and asset manager. Also, asset managers need to implement their own risk management practices, which in this context is about investments, specifically diversifying investments, and again, focusing on capital requirements. Third is issuers. There's a lot of um, a lot of attention put specifically on asset reference token issuers and e-money token issuers. So again, e-money token issuers, this is a stable coin. This would be a stable coin like USDC or USDT, whereas an asset reference token is essentially any crypto asset that is referencing another asset. So this can be something like wrapped ETH or any wrapped token that is trading on multiple blockchain networks, or it can be a wrapped asset like gold. Um, so all token issuers, not just these two types, but all need to be issuing white papers. And there's a lot of rules on what should be included in this white paper and also rules about how the launch should be conducted. They need to adhere to strict marketing and advertising guidelines. And finally, they have their own set of risk management guidelines that are outlined under MICA. And finally, custodians. Custodians need to segregate and safe keep their client assets. They need to maintain accurate records and they need to ensure protection against cyber threats and operational risks. So again, every CASP has their own specific requirements, but there are some universal requirements that all CASPs must adhere to. So if we move on, the next section is going to focus specifically on data, which is the core topic of this webinar today. So first, what are some of the data obligations? If we can go to the next slide. So data is really essential to stay compliant. It's essential for CASPs, it's essential for regulators, and also for law enforcement agencies to best prepare for MICA. So the list to the right includes eight examples of MICA use cases and that would involve and actually need data in order to stay compliant. The first is market abuse. Essentially, all trading platforms must prove that no abuse is occurring on their platform. The second is transaction monitoring. This is very important for anti-money laundering rules and making sure that users of a platform are not interacting with uh, essentially suspicious or non-compliant wallets. The third is a bit more abstract. It is proving resiliency. So one of the core I guess, missions of MICA is resiliency, that state crypto markets must be resilient and the providers within them must be resilient. And for trading platforms and specifically, it states that they need to have data for up to two years. Um, this means that they almost certainly will need a market data backup because redundancy is a critical component of resiliency. The fourth is CASP licensing. Licensing is from the regulator's perspective, this is from the, the local regulator's perspective, they will need to validate and grant licenses, and they'll probably need to have their own independent source of data in order to do so. The fifth is risk management. There's quite a few risk management details in this document, but specifically issuers, they need to monitor liquidity and perform regular stress tests. Uh, the sixth is best execution. This concerns brokers. Brokers must pr prove to the national competent authorities that they comply with best execution. Um, seventh is reporting. There's a lot of reporting details about um, specifically issuers of tokens. They must report the market cap, the value, and the number of transactions. And this all requires data. And then finally, we have reserves management. All CASPs must compute their capital reserves and liabilities. So again, this was a lot of information, but this is just to show that there is a lot of data that is involved in staying compliant with MICA. So if we move on to the next slide, now we're going to give a couple examples of how what exactly we mean by data. So this first example is looking specifically at market abuse. 
Historically, market abuse has been a persistent problem, specifically on trading platforms. Even today, there are still clear instances of market abuse. Some examples of this include things like insider trading, wash trading, spoofing, and price manipulation. Data is really essential for doing investigations into market abuse for both the trading platform themselves, but also for regulators that need to grant licenses. So here are two examples of how data is highlighting some types of market abuse. On the left, we see an example of wash trading. Um, Kaiko Research, we took all trades on HTX, which was formerly known as Huobi, and we found some clear instances of wash trading essentially buy and sell orders happening at the same moment in time um, for a specific crypto token. On the right, we see um, this is just an example of what spoofing could be. This is just artificially influenced supply um, on an order book. So it's really important to have access to order book data in this example. And you can sort of see either an artificial bid wall or an artificial ask wall. Um, and this, again, is a type of manipulation. So if we move on to the next slide, we'll see a second example. This is transaction monitoring. So almost all trading platforms at this point work with a transaction monitoring provider. Um, the goal of this is to make sure all of their customers' wallets and transactions are not interacting with any potential illicit sources. So transaction monitoring is crucial um, not just for trading platforms, it's essentially for every crypto service provider that interacts with crypto and manages crypto. So some examples of how you use this data, you can trace hacks. For example, you want to make sure that crypto stolen from the FTX wallet hack does not end up on your platform. You can also make sure that users of your platform are not using funds that were previously stolen. For example, the chart here, we are showing how stolen ETH from KuCoin was eventually transferred to Tornado Cash. So this is just a way to make sure that you are not, uh, users are not interacting with unauthorized counterparties. So if we move on to the next slide, we see um, the third example, which is reporting. Reporting is very important specifically for asset reference token issuers. There's a lot of fine print on what is like the specific data points that they, they need to include in their regular reports to regional regulators. Um, ART issuers, asset reference token issuers, need to provide updates on the average daily transaction volume of their token, stuff like the number of holders and the value of their tokens. And this requires access to data. So here we show some examples of average daily transaction volume. You can see that this is important for measuring on both centralized exchanges and decentralized exchanges. A data provider is able to provide a global outlook of this volume. Whereas on the right, this concerns the supply of a token held by um, a user on chain. And so you would have to break down the supply of this token um, across all of the various wallets that it is sitting in. So if we move on to the last example, um, this is specifically from the licensor's perspective, from regulators, they need to be able to validate information from specific CASPs. Um, the, the NCAs, they must be able to assess the financial adequacy and compliance of a CASP. And one example of this specifically involves on-chain reserves. Um, I know there was a lot of talk about proof of reserves, and it's just about making sure that the CASP is when they report the value of assets in their wallets, that it actually matches on chain. So this is something you can validate by looking at the list of wallets and the breakdown of assets inside. You can also try and root out examples of reserves manipulation, which essentially is just an attempt to change the balance of wallets, either before, typically before an upcoming audit. So if we move on, those four examples, the goal is to show, just give a sneak peek into how data can be used by both CASPs and regulating authorities in order to stay compliant with MICA. So overall, there are many, many benefits to partnering with a data provider. I think the most important one here is neutrality. Data providers are neutral um, and they're transparent and they, they typically don't have any misaligned interests, which is really important in the context of MICA. Um, they will guarantee data integrity, integrity and security. Um, also, just logistically, it's quite 
cost effective to outsource this. And then finally, there is a broad market view. They provide a broad market view. With MICA, there are many, many different uh, trading platforms and types of service providers that are essentially using crypto on many networks across many exchanges. And so it's important to get all of this data in one place. It just makes things 10 times easier. So ultimately, data will need to be at the very heart of your preparation for MICA, um, and it's best to get a head start today. So I think that concludes our presentation. Um, you can learn more at our website, kaiko.com, or email Elodie, the email here. And now we will take some time to answer some questions. Uh, unfortunately, um, do we have time for questions? Um, anyway, yes. thank you. Yes, um, we, we are good. Thank you so much for Clara and Elodie's presentation and uh, the really emphasis on the importance of data for compliance with Mika. And I want to start with saying like, you've already explained the way that the upcoming regulation will impact different types of crypto service providers. And you've already put it beautifully in, into the categories of exchanges, wallets, and custodians. Moving forward, what steps do you think these entities need to take immediately? What's the most important step and the one that they should prioritize as they start preparing for the upcoming uh, requirements for compliance? You want to start, Clara, or do you want me to? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very long list of rules per CASP. So the most important thing is to actually read it yourself. Um, and to and, and at some point for some CASPs, it's like like 20 plus pages for just detailing all of the requirements that they need. So it's a lot. And I would say that's most important is to just like read it first. <laughs> um, Familiarize yourself. Point, yes. I can maybe add to that. Just, I mean, you, you, Clara is absolutely right. Like uh, it's actually, you know, on the CASP liability to know what they have to do. Um, you have a lot of details in, in, in Mika. One thing I could say though, is we're seeing, you know, a convergence toward traditional finance in the sense that we're seeing Mika really bringing more maturity. Um, Clara mentioned a lot resiliency. Um, and I think there was a question around that, around, you know, resiliency, like redundancy, all of these kind of things. That means you have to review your operational models to ensure that you don't have, I mean, conflict of interest is really, you know, important for a lot of the, the CASPs. Um, but also having a resilient and redundant infrastructure that will enable you to to deliver um, you know a better product. On the same level, we talked about around the importance of data, uh, the quality of data. It's also extremely important. I mean, it's listed. You know, the that you need to have a good quality of data. It's listed um, in Article Thirty Six, if I'm not mistaken, of Mika today, where you cannot just take random uh, source of data that you will find for free in the internet. That works. You know, in the past couple of years it will not be moving forward. You need to have, you know, transparency into like the the pricing and all the different data input that you will have. Um, we talk about market capitalization. We talked about for custodian liability. It means like you are going to be liable up to the amounts that, you know, uh, your clients could lose. How do you define this uh, amount of liability? You need to have an equivalent in fiat and the price that you will need to go from uh, basically crypto view with to fiat is extremely important considering the volatility of crypto assets and the the changes that you will have. So I would say, you know, maturity is the, the a good summary and then all the specifics will be listed in the agreement. Um, every single CASP, in my opinion, should be thinking about their operational model and ensuring that they are covered and they are also working with uh, best-in-class providers and suppliers in, in what they're doing, um, including on their own processes. Right, right. Super helpful. Very, very insightful. And and thank you again for, for the way you've thoroughly presented the data and, and why and how it is important. For CASPs also, as they're evaluating their requirements, it seems like a lot of different considerations. Uh, what deadlines would you say are, are most critical or, or important milestones coming up? Uh, as as we expect to to move forward with Mika, um, that folks should be aware of. I can take that if you want, Clara. Mm -hmm. On so these are like the two dates we mentioned: June, which is in two and a half months, just to be very transparent. Mm -hmm. um, for 
for the two asset classes that we we mentioned. So basically, if you're a stablecoin issuer, um, when we talk about you know e-money tokens, so e-money tokens issuers, and for um, also the art uh, tokens, it's coming into effect in June. So in two and a half months, any issuers or any um, of the e-money tokens or art tokens needs to be compliant with Mika. The second really important deadline is December. Um, all the CASPs and other assets need to be compliant with Mika by the end of this year. Excellent. So it's coming up. Next very question <laughs> from the audience. Yes, very soon. Um, as for the um, other kinds of data that will have to be reported regularly, um, what about average daily transactions or number of holders? What other kinds of data will have to be reported in, in the future? So there's for stable coins and ART tokens, asset reference tokens, they, they, there's a lot of requirements about valuing the number of assets um, held. Um, and so there's a big valuation component to that. And valuation can be quite tricky um, just because you need to make sure you have really good price data. Um, this is what Elodie was saying. You need to be able to um, to prove that the price you have is mark to market. That's specifically the language that is used in this document. Um, and this is just a pricing methodology used in traditional finance. Um, and other than that, I would I would check. I know that there were some other data points. I don't have the exact list now, but it really is focused on valuation transactions and holders. Those were the core three. I would add to that maybe. I mean, we talked about market cap as well. Um, and there is another thing is for like the amount of reserves. So there are a lot of, um, you know, uh, reserves and liquidity that some of the token issuers have to comply with. And it's usually a percentage of the token in circulation. It's going back into, you know, valuation in order to know how much you need to have as like reserves. You need to assess mm -hmm. how many tokens, but what's the value? What's the value equivalent? Um, so this is also another, I mean, um, reserves basically is, is another uh, requirement for a lot of the, the issuers. Would data providers uh, for CASPs need to be certified by any specific authority? I don't, I don't think so because data providers don't issue or provide crypto asset services. And that's like the core, like that's the purpose of MICA. So a data provider technically does not count. You, if, if I may add to that completely with Polara, like uh, we're not, I mean, as a data provider, we, we are not regulated in that sense. However, if you are a CASP and you are regulated or you are a regulator and you need help in order to choose your data provider, there are a couple of things that you should look at. Um, we, we talked about valuation, extremely important to give the price of a token in order to, to get to the requirements that Mika, um, you know, uh, requires. You should look at the, for pricing, you should look at transparency and resilience. We know, for example, that there are several methodology that can be used um, and one is extremely, is way better than, than others. Just if you look into like a stress environment, even at the Bitcoin USD pair, for example, you will see like a 90% price difference depending on the methodology that you're using to uh, price your assets. And hence, what we would advise is when you select your data provider uh, to really look into the methodology that they're using, look at the, the quality of the product that they're using. And you can, you know, there are several ways, I'm sure your technical teams um, can, you know, assess that based on the formula, data quality and other monitoring that are put in place. But definitely, you know, the quality of the product is extremely important. The second is also, you will see like different maturities. Um, you know, it's like anything, right? It's a business. It requires a lot of investment. As we mentioned, it's 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 complex to navigate the data ecosystem. It costs a lot of money. Um, so in order to continue to comply and stay up to date with what's happening, you should also look at the architecture, how the data provider's uh, architecture is, is built, is done. Do they have support in place um, to ensure the, the delivery of the institutional grade? I would say, you know, like a premium product and services that you will you'll be looking at. Great. Building on that actually is the next question. Would you recommend particular data providers to be perfectly equipped for MICA and for somehow having those types of data providers 
uh, be a guarantee for regulators? Uh, let me make sure I understand the question. Um, you say like if we have some recommendations of providers, that's what you're asking? Uh, I think it's just, would you recommend providers to be perfectly equipped for Mika? Wh whatever that means to you. I and and I mean, as I would say perfectly uh, equipped for Mika being like a guarantee for regulators. But go on. I would say there's generally two types of data providers. There's the first, which is like Kaiko. Um, Kaiko is a market data provider. We also have some on-chain data like supply and wallet data. Um, but what we don't do is stuff that involves like like transaction screening, that's where you would want to go to a specialized data provider for that. And that's really important, mostly for trading platforms. So that's the other type of provider is a specifically a transaction screening data provider, um, like elliptic or chain analysis. And I would add to that is basically you need to have both because otherwise you will just get like a part of the picture, right? It's like what you need is to have to, to be able to comply with all the requirements that we listed. Mm -hmm. And as you saw, there are quite lots. I mean, when you talk about like the, the number of transactions, the aggregated value, when you talk about market capitalization, you need a data provider um, that provides market data, which is what we do. Uh, and then you also need uh, indeed, you know, to know who is behind these wallets or like for AML, KYC, you will need another another provider um, to to help uh, to help with that. In the case of non-compliance with MICA, what are the penalties for non-compliance and how can CASPs mitigate these risks? I can start, Clara, if you want. Good. So you have several penalties depending on the um, depending on the category. Basically, um, you can go up to you know like a, a few millions um, of euros or a percentage. So it's it's clearly defined into Mica. It depends into it depends on like which category you fall into, and it depends on the fraud that's you know you're being um, you're being um, accused of. Um, yeah. As we have seen yeah. also, um, yeah. it wasn't yeah. necessarily into yeah. into Mica, but we have also seen you know in the in the news like that some of the uh, the management of the the companies I mean can be you know uh, penal or criminal in some cases. So there is also beyond the fine that you have, um, that could be you know, in a couple of millions uh, of dollars or more, depending on the percentage uh, of, of the fraud. But also, um, I mean, we have seen you know, in, the, in the different cases that you also have an implication of the, the management in the different, in the different companies' uh, CASPs in those categories. Okay. And finally, could you provide examples of best practices that can help CASPs integrate Mika's requirements into existing operational processes. Do you want to start, Clara? Uh, do you mind repeating the question? Sure, it's kind of long. What are examples of best practices that CASPs can adopt in order to integrate Mika's requirements into their existing operational processes? Um, I mean, it's sort of like what we've discussed already. It's, it's about doing your own research. It's the CASP's ob obligation to be able to figure out what they need. And then on the data perspective, it's about first making sure you have the resources and the skill set to manage this data. Um, and you know, like how to apply it best. Um, and so that is, you know, you typically work with the data provider. Most enterprise data providers can sit down and help you directly with integrations. Um, and specifically for MICA, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of specialized services that are popping up to help with compliance. There is one last thing, Diana, that we didn't mention mm -hmm. in the previous question is, you know, saying that, you know, there is no indeed, like there is no certificate or label to say like, oh, this provider is best equipped to work with you or to support you throughout, you know, your adoption or like transition to, to have those new processes in place for Mika. There is one thing that's important though, is just, you know, speaking by experience, like we, worked a lot in 2023 with a lot of different regulators. Like we, you know, there were a lot of RFPs going on and um, we won every single one of them in those categories. As Clara mentioned, like a portion of the answer, I would recommend that you work with providers that are used to working with other regulators. As you see, Mika is a, a unified uh, framework across Europe. And we know that this may be an inspiration or like maybe leveraged by other um, jurisdictions in different parts of the world to, uh, you know, to, to leverage. So I would recommend working with some um, providers that are used to working with regulators because they can be advisor beyond just providing the service, 
because they have worked with other regulators, they will be able to to tell you. I mean, we can tell you for the, from the conversations we have had with different regulators, you know, in North America, in Europe, in the Middle East, in 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 Asia, um, that there are some you know common ground to all of those regulators. They all need to you know it's all going back to three things. You need to ensure that it works toward market stability. You need to put, protect the customers um, and you need to bring more transparency and security. And so considering those three pillars are common, you know, across all regulators, working with providers that are used to working with those regulators, I think will also be very helpful. Excellent. Now it's time to close. Thank you so much to Clara and Elodie and to Keiko for joining us today. It was such a thoughtful and eye-opening presentation and Q&A on the importance of data. Data underlies everything and you're experts on that. And it's essential now more than more than before in the sense of compliance with the upcoming EU regulations. We look forward to learning more about Kaiko's progress. A recording of this presentation will be circulated to all those who registered and it will also be shared publicly on GBBC's YouTube channel. Thank you all and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.